Good morning, everyone. My name is Gabriel Green. I am the Director of Artistic Development, and welcome to another episode of Coffee with the Playhouse. We're just a week out from the start of our DNA New Work series, which will be the first time we bring actors and audiences back together in a room in over 16 months. And today we're lucky enough to be joined by members of the creative teams from each of the four shows in DNA to talk about their plays and new play development. While we wait for the latecomers to take their seats, we've got some DNA themed trivia questions for you this morning. As always, email your answers to marketing at ljp.org and be entered to win a gift card for some delicious coffee. Here we go with the first question. What year did the DNA series start? I was gonna say earlier, I, I was gonna say what year in the annual series it was, uh, which might've been a hint, of course, we missed a year. So you would have had to subtract a year, uh, but keep your ears open. As always, uh, spoilers can come out during the conversation, which will give you hints to the answers. Here we go with the second question. What Chiara Alegria Hudes and Aaron McKeown musical began its life as a DNA series workshop? This is a musical that has since been seen all over the country. It went to the public theater uh, the following year and is coming back to the San Diego area. I believe the Patio Playhouse is going to be mounting a production of it. And our final question. The first year of the DNA series included The Who and the What by what Pulitzer Prize winning playwright and past Coffee with the Playhouse guest? So write down the answers to those three questions. Keep your ears open in case the hints arise during the conversation. Email it all to marketing at ljp.org and be entered for that gift card. All right, it's my great pleasure to introduce the Managing Director of La Jolla Playhouse, Debbie Buckholtz. Thank you, Gabe. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it is such a pleasure to be here and I am delighted to welcome you to our July Coffee with the Playhouse. Um, as you may see, we are back in our offices. Staff is largely back in, and actually in front of my office right now, the load-in for the garden is happening. It's so exciting to be back in the theater. Before that happens, we have several really terrific events that are planned for you this summer, including our pop-up without walls event in Liberty Station, which is gonna take place August 14th and 15th. And today you're gonna hear from some of the artists in our DNA New Work series that is, as Gabe mentioned, taking place later on this month. In addition, we're also, doing a special event, excuse me, special engagement of Hassan Minhaj, his, play, his piece Experiment Time at the end of this month. So there's a whole lot going on. The DNA series has been so popular that this year we're expanding it to two readings for each play, running July 22nd through 25th and July 31st through August 1st. So we can't, really just can't wait to welcome you back to the Playhouse. Um, for in-person performances, <laughs> a little choked up. Anyhow, thank you so much for staying with us for this last year and a half, for being patrons, donors, um, watching our Digital Without Walls series, just everything that you've done to support us. You can't imagine how much we appreciate it. So now it's my pleasure to introduce the Rich Family Artistic Director of La Jolla Playhouse, Christopher Ashley. Debbie, thank you so, so much. Um, and I have to say, you are remarkably sparkly this morning. Uh, yeah, you're bringing a little life. bit of sparkle <laughs> to our lives, so I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Um, like Debbie, I am uh, incredibly excited to be moving back into um, live performance. And um, uh, one of our first things is going to be this wonderful DNA New Work series, now in its eighth year, um, offering playwrights and directors the chance to develop a script uh, by providing rehearsal time, space, and resources culminating in public readings. Um, our audience gives, uh, get a closer look at the play development process um, while allowing us to develop uh, new work and foster relationships with um, uh, playwrights who are new to us and um, extraordinary directors. So um, I wanna move in to give you a little sense of the, the guests tonight. Uh, today, this afternoon, this morning. Uh, we have uh, Francisca uh, da Silvera, Noah Diaz, Andrew Rosendorf, and Alice Tuan. So um, Fran is the author of our DNA play, Not For Profit or the Equity, Diversity and Inclusion play. She's a Cape Verdean American playwright and Boston native. In 2018, she made Arts Boston's list of 10 contemporary black playwrights you should know. She's a current member of the Public Theater's Emerging Writers Group and her full length plays include Can I Touch It? 
Heritage Hills Naturals and Pay No Worship. So we're excited to have uh, Francesca with us today. Noah Diaz uh, wrote our DNA play, All the Men Who Have Frightened Me. It's also a Playhouse Commission. Um, he is a theater and television writer from the Iowa-Nebraska border. His plays have been developed or produced at the Roundabout Theater, Baltimore Center Stage, Playwrights well, Realm, where he's the current Page One resident playwright. And he is a recipient of the ASCAP Cole Porter Prize for Excellence in Playwriting. Noah's works include Rock Egg Spoon, Richard and Jane and Dick and Sally, and The Juniors. So we're delighted to have him with us today. Andrew Rosendorf is the author of our DNA piece, One Shot. Um, uh, this, um, uh, Andrew's had his work produced or developed at MCC, Kansas City Rep, uh, Signature Theater, among many others. He's an alum of the Nation New Play Network Playwright in Residence program, and has been a space on Rider Farm Fellow. Current core writer at the Playwright Center, his works include Refuge, Paper Cut, Mermaid and Tranquil, which was part of our DNA series in 2014. And last, but um, uh, in no way least, is the dramaturg for our DNA play, Sumo. Uh, playwright in her own right, Alice is the author of Ajax, um, Poor Nobody, Hit, Batch, An American Bachelorette Party Spectacle, Last of the Sons, The Roaring Girl, Ikebana, and Coastline. Her most recent plays concern Americans in Shanghai, Cox Crow, and private rivals. She's also a TCG resident playwright at East West Players and has taught playwriting at CalArts and East West Players. It's a mouthful because they have extraordinary resumes. So why don't you uh, welcome um, our, our guests to the screen. Um, here we all are. It's good to see you um, uh, folks, uh, whether it's uh, morning or afternoon in your time zone. Uh, welcome to the screen. Hi. Uh, thank you, Andrew, for uh, uh, keeping the coffee theme going that uh, Gabe started. Oh, uh, Fran's got it too. Uh, <laughs> oh, Alice too. Uh, Noah, you and I are the only ones without coffee. But right. we're, we're, I'm a little I'm, jealous that Gabe has like a La Jolla specific coffee mug. Well, it might be yours one day. It could be. <laughs> you, you, I, we don't want to make promises we can't keep, but that's actually one we could probably fulfill. Um, so, um, can we just get a, start out a little bit with um, uh, give give us a a, a little taste of, uh, of of your play? What's the what's it about? What's the story of it? Uh, maybe a little a little. What was the seed of of, of how it uh, how it came to be? Um, does anybody want to want to uh, plunge in and be the to be the first to start? Okay, uh, uh, Fran, look at you, Fran. Go oh. for it. I was always that kid in class that like, I love it. waited five <laughs> seconds and then if no one said anything. Um, yeah, so uh, my play, Not for Profit, or the Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion play, um, is uh, set at an education nonprofit in Boston. Um, the nonprofit has like a very diverse staff. Um, the interim CEO is a black woman. Um, and yet there is still like a lot of um, toxicity. <laughs> Um, and a lot of like interdepartmental conflict. Um, and that is because it is still a nonprofit and built within that structure um, and was built on a system of white supremacy. So it doesn't just go away just because your staff is, um, is more diverse. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, you know, the solution that they have thought of is to of course, bring in a young white male consultant to solve all of these issues. <laughs> so clearly that goes really well. Um, and I, you know, the play, the idea for the play um, came from my years of working at various different nonprofits uh, in Boston. Um, and just seeing like what the disparity was between the people who were doing the on the ground work um, and those who were actually like in positions of power and making decisions. Um, and uh, from like each nonprofit that I went to realizing like, these are, you know, the work that they do may be in different fields, but but you know the the issues are still the same again because of this pre-existing structure, um, and so that you know after about the third one, I was like, this makes me really annoyed, <laughs> um, and so I was like, why not write write a play about it? Because that's usually 
how it happens. I get really annoyed or really angry about something. And I'm like, how do I dramatize this? Um, so that we can all feel a sense of catharsis. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm, I'm really excited for this workshop that's about to happen because it'll be the first time that this play has been on its feet, um, like developed on its feet um, in, in its entirety. Um, and it, it, you know, it requires that um, because the, um, it's set at, in this office space that's an open concept office space. And <laughs> it is that um, everyone's on stage all of the time. And so there's like the, the choreography of what an office is and who's, who's moving around where and who's like casually, you know, eavesdropping on what that, um, I'm, I'm excited to discover by being in person, which we haven't been able to do um, through a Zoom workshop. So I'm, I'm so like, I'm so ready to get into it and to, you know, position people in their little like faux cubicles um, to see what we can learn. I love that. And I'm, 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 I'm smiling because La Jolla Playhouse fully has an open office plan <laughs> where everybody can hear everything in those cubicles and glass walls. And so uh, we, uh, you're going to be doing a play that also speaks about what our office culture. Is like. <laughs> um, I also love that you're, this is sort of a first time um, ever to, to, to deal with it in space. Um, so many of my favorite DNA um, readings are, are of very first readings of plays, like they're just watching the, the author discover, you know, oh, that's what this play is. Uh, and watching people kind of engage with the play for the very first time. There's something really exciting about that. Um, yeah. All right. Sorry, yeah, I was just gonna say in our very first, oh, trivia hunters, listen up. In our very first <laughs> DNA series, when we did Ad Akhtar's The Who and the What, uh, that piece was so new that Ad didn't actually realize that his agent had sent me the script and <laughs> was a little put off. He's like, that, that draft wasn't ready for public consumption. And I said, but we wanna do it in DNA. <laughs> so sometimes it's really, really, really new. Yes, which and that play was like it was super raw, but already you could feel wow, there's an incredibly exciting show in this, um, as there is in yours, friend. So thank you for uh, for for writing this brand new play. Uh, all right, who'd like to plunge next? Uh, talk a little bit about their uh, about their show. Uh, all right, I'm now you, you, you introduced the school uh, metaphor. I'm just going to be the the bad teacher, uh, uh, Andrew. I can see you're moving a little bit. How about you? Go for it. Oh, I'm so glad that I decided to move in that moment. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, yeah. Um, so one shot is a play uh, that takes place in a video rental store. If you remember those, um, it is uh, modeled after a store uh, that I like basically grew up in. Uh, video rental stores are very close to me personally um, and was often a place that I would go to like escape the world around me and also seek uh, stories and representation that I wasn't seeing else elsewhere, um, especially trying to like hunt for like the stories about um, people who were homosexual, who were gay and like where I could find them. You know, movies like Jeffrey. Um, oh. <laughs> but, <laughs> um, uh, and so the, the play uh, it takes some inspiration from that. Um, and especially uh, as we went through the previous uh, presidency, I'll call it that, and um, uh, how I was experiencing in ways that I've never experienced before in my life, um, uh, homophobia, uh, as well as uh, anti-Semitism, uh, that it was just hitting me in ways that for much of my life it wasn't but in some ways also felt very parallel to what it was like to grow up in the 1990s uh, with uh, like Matthew Shepard and things along those lines that were happening at the, at the time. And so it felt very much about like looking at the time that I was a teenager and growing up and grappling um, with some of the same issues that we're grappling with now. And it centered on two um, really uh, best friends who work at this video store who are waiting to hear about a potential scholarship that may or may not change their life. And that's sort of where we jump off. And it's a play very much about um, white privilege and white fragility and Jewish fragility um, and uh, who gets to tell what stories and the space uh, for those stories, um, as well as uh, where are our safe spaces anymore? And what do we do when someone we love makes our space not safe? 
Fantastic. Even yeah. though there are very few uh, video stores left, that sounds like a very pertinent to the current moment. <laughs> That's, uh, for sure. uh, Noah, Alice, whenever you want to jump. I can go. OK, great. Go. Uh, my play is titled All the Men Who've Frightened Me. Uh, it is about a uh, trans man named Ty and his wife, Nora, who are moving into his childhood home after his mother has decided to move out. Uh, we learned that uh, Nora is unable to conceive a child. Uh, and in this uh, moment of trauma and learning that, uh, he offers to carry the child himself. Uh, and so like that is uh, kind of like the starting point, the literal first scene of the play. Uh, and what ends up happening is uh, over the course of the play, as Ty learns and reckons with this decision that he has made, and also uh, having learned from those around him that he has always carried just an inherent fear of men themselves. Uh, a long line of men from Ty's past inexplicably begin appearing in the house uh, from cupboards and underneath couch cushions. Um, and so I think the play is very much a uh, haunted house play. Uh, and whatever that means, it means about what we can carry literally inside of ourselves, mm. what, what uh, the houses we have lived in carry inside uh, of themselves and um, how we continue to carry on. Uh, generations of, I guess, trauma, but not even, you know, just generations of history, uh, familial history, personal history, and what we choose to um, keep carrying with us and what we choose to leave behind. So, and I don't know, then you have a baby. <laughs> and then you, you have a baby. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. Uh, I, and I'm, a, I'm from the first moment I read your first like page of your play, I was all the way hooked. It's in, incredibly just kind of audacious and intriguing and personal in great, great ways. So um, thank you. Um, Alice, do you want to talk a little bit about Sumo? Sure. Yes, definitely. Um, I do have to say when I was reading the description of Noah's play, I was like, Oh, I just, you know, I'm still kind of like old school. I just, my brain won't flick over when it says, and he will carry the baby. I'm like, how is that possible? And just the whole, just um, adjusting to the the trans being and just, it's it's incredible. It's, I'm very much looking forward to hearing about the play. So I, um, I am a playwright associate at East West Players. And uh, every year I facilitate a group of playwrights for uh, for monthly meetings, um, Snehal Desai, the artistic director, wanted to just give space for folks to write a play. And the only requirement is that it has to have an Asian in it because it's not just Asian playwrights, it's a whole group of playwrights. And so this last year, um, Lisa Dring was in that playwrights group and it's just been a pleasure to watch the sumo play bloom. I mean, I literally got to see it before she went to McDowell and um, it was very kind of academic and very, you know, informational and not quite activated yet. And she went to McDowell in December and January and something happened. I think that she, she said something about the unconscious was able to have this great space. And I think like with all the, the austere landscape and the snow and she came back with this activation of the sumo play, which is, as the title suggests, six Asian sumo wrestlers <laughs> who can be played by Asians, Asian Americans, men of color. It's very open. It's a it's traditional kind of exploration of sumo, but also with Lisa Dring's just wonderful and just acute ability to just pop the pop into. You know, so it's traditional, but then it's also so super modern too. And it and it really um, is looking at the traditional art form that was an identity, like an ancient art form for the Japanese, where it's man versus God, the two sumo wrestlers, one's representing the gods, one's representing um, the common people as humans, and they're to fight for the ownership of Japan. And of course, of course, the divine always win. That's why the country is not led by farmers and fishermen. And so the, the way that she presents the play is very intimate. It's surprisingly intimate. We get to go into the psyches of the sumo wrestlers. They're talking about their body images, like getting very visceral um, recountings of what it's like to fight, but also still having the hierarchy. I mean, there's one, there's one scene 
where the sumo show for the La Jolla audience will come about to kind of get all the exposition and just get, get everyone kind of situated into what sumo wrestling is, mm -hmm. which is so great. So it's like a, it's the entertainment versus what is the art form? And I think that so many of the, the themes are so much about, you know, what is the traditional identity that is trying to be upheld, even though it might be acronistic with the current like individual actualization. And so much of the existential question for the, the folks in the Summa Heya is, do we go for this grotesque body dysmorphing for the sake of tradition and this possible God status? Or do we leave what's known and go into the unknown and find out who we are and have to leave everything behind and possibly be invisible and just I don't know, a failure in capitalism. So much of this play has to do with capitalism. I mean, like there's this one great um, sentence where it's like, yes, there were gods, there were gods before we had to pay bills and find babysitters and figure out that all delicious foods were apparently not good for you. There were gods, you know? So it's this gorgeous blend of the high and the low. Hmm. And um, yeah, I'm just, I'm so thrilled because I've been, I've been, you know, as a doula turd, <laughs> I've been watching this play slowly be born, and and Lisa had written to me. She has lots of stuff I can I can share with you too about her process and stuff. But she really wants to see. I really want to see this up on the feet with the bodies in space. That's what's going to be so exciting in this DNA process. I love that. And doula turg is my new favorite word of the day. Okay. Oh, the week. <laughs> I love yeah, that. Yeah, Alice, can I just get you to talk about my plays whenever I need to talk about them? Can I just <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Alice, Absolutely. Just Absolutely. Log off. <laughs> Alice, you're doing it all now. <laughs> Send them all over. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'll be the um, drama matrix. It's the drama matrix. <laughs> oh, I like that too. <laughs> Here's another word. I just yeah. sit yeah. around and think of terms. That's my, that's my dramaturgy role. That is dramaturgy, honey. That is it. <laughs> so, Gabe, you're a dramaturg, but you're sadly can never be a, a dramatrix or a doula turg. So, I, yeah. Why do you have to place walls around me? I don't. I know, right? <laughs> you can identify however you want. Uh, so, can you talk? You've sort of put the the program together. You've you read a you know huge um, volume of exciting um, new work um, and um, settled on these four. Can you talk about uh, what led you led you to these four and and what you see as kind of commonalities and differences, maybe a little bit? Absolutely. I, it, it struck me just now as uh, you each were describing the plays that there is for each to varying degrees, of course, amongst the plays, um, this grounding of naturalism that is um, to varying degrees broken open in each of the plays. And I, I think, uh, Noah, perhaps most explicitly in yours, your, your plays tend to create worlds then, that you then gleefully smash uh, into heightened theatrical um, wonder. But all of these plays, uh, you know, and Andrew, I'm, without giving away any spoilers, but there, there are always there, there are breaks in each of these four that are very playful, uh, and sometimes they're rooted in justifiable anger about uh, what's going on. Uh, sometimes it's it's rooted in um, regret and wistfulness. But I, I think all of these four, in really interesting ways, uh, walk that line. The other thing. Um, that I wasn't really cognizant of at the time, but uh, that has struck me as I have thought of these four plays together, is that they all are very concerned with corporeality. This idea that um, they're all centered on how we inhabit our bodies and how those bodies inhabit the spaces that we occupy. And they take up room and, and whether that's uh, emotionally or phys in, in the case of sumo, physically, these six men who are bulking up, uh, who are, who are ra you know, adding all of these pounds to their bodies in pursuit of the success, or more emotionally or more um, politically, all of these plays, uh, understandably, are very concerned with how we take up space uh, in this moment uh, in really wonderful ways. Fantastic. I love um, if if any of you want to um, talk about either how, sort of how you got your start, how you began um, to write, and or is is there somebody who was a mentor to you or somebody who lifted you up um, and really um, you know helped guide you into the work you're doing? Uh, Fran, are you still are you, are you still willing to be the first? 
I'll be the first, yeah. Okay. Um, how did I get get the start? Um, yeah. Honestly, I've been writing since I was um, since I was small. Um, I really got into it by writing really terrible Harry Potter fan fiction. Um, honestly, like in middle school and just fan fiction of all kinds. Uh, um, there's still there's only one um, piece that I've written that I can still find on the internet. Um, and it is a piece of charmed fan fiction, um, which I haven't I haven't reread it. But ever ever so often, I'll go and like look to see if there are new comments. Um, and as recently as like a year ago, someone people are like, "I hope you come back. I really love this." Um, is it is it fic fan fiction for Shannon Doherty or or post Shannon Doherty? No, it's, it's post Shannon. <laughs> Um, so if anyone on like the staffing team of the new charm reboot wants to reach out to me i'm ready um but yes i i started writing um writing plays in high school and then did a really wonderful um summer program before my senior year at tish that like took me to new york city for a few weeks and i was, saw all the glitz and the glam of new york city and i was like I could do this for real. Um, and then proceeded to not do it for real. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I've, I'm, I also work as a dramaturg um, and have been doing that um, pretty consistently for the last, like for the last seven years um, and as, as a career, which is crazy to think that like dramaturgy is my career. Um, as well as writing, um, and then now shifting to be like more on the writing side than on the dramaturgy side, which is very exciting and very daunting. Um, but uh, there have been a couple of people in my life that have straddled both of those worlds as well, playwright, dramaturg, that have been really influential. Um, one of those is, uh, one of them is Kirsten Greenwich, who is a fantastic, Fantastic playwright who um, I've been lucky enough to dramaturg a couple of her um, shows um, from like the the infancy idea stage, um, and we worked together at Company One Theater when I was still in Boston, um, and uh, co-ran the Play Lab program that they run there for emerging writers, um, and to be able to see her um, navigate not only her work like. And she's she's a very busy lady. <laughs> um, it has like so many commissions at all times, but then also see her make space um, and create opportunities for other for writers at all um, stages, and to be so generous with her time, even though she has so very little of it, um, is something that I that I really admire, and I try to take with me um, as I sort of juggle those two hats. Um, and then the second person, her name is Nicola McCartney. Um, she ran the uh, playwriting program at the University of Edinburgh, Scotland, which is where I did my grad year. Um, and she's also a playwright dramaturg and um, like kicked my ass. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if I can, if I can say that. Um, but really when, when I got to that program in 2018, I was at a really weird, point because I'd been doing dramaturgy and focusing on other people's work for so long and and you know said to myself this is your opportunity to go and focus on your own plays and I got there and I wasn't sort of doing that and so at some point like a few months in she's like what are you doing here do you want to be here what are you writing about like <laughs> in a way that um you know, helped me to channel some of that anger that, that I was mentioning before. She's like, I can tell you're angry, but what are you doing with it? Um, mm -hmm. And unsurprisingly, that was the year that I started writing not for profit. <laughs> um, and so being, being able to see someone who um, was not only again, like following her own dreams with her own writing career, but helping writers to like be very rigorous in the work that they're doing to take it beyond the you know, this is a passion, this is a hobby, like, you know, this is my art to, you know, the next stage of like, well, yes, of course, it's all of those things, but it's also your career, like, you know, step it up a notch. Um, and so
So I, I thank both of those people um, and quote them very, very often. Um, one of my favorite things that Nicola ever said to me was, uh, let it be shit um, about the first draft. You know, however it comes out, it doesn't matter. As long as it comes out, let it be shit. And then, you know, the real work starts from there. I love that you uh, mentioned um, Kirsten because because our audience has engaged with her work a couple of different times. Um, her play uh, Milk Like Sugar was done uh, on our um, stages and um, she had a, a play developed through the DNA um, series. I want to say three years ago, Gabe, three, four. Yeah, might might have been five or so. Yeah. Oh, uh, but, um, really, really interesting new play. So um, we share your um, enthusiasm for her and uh, who she is in the world. Uh, okay, so we can't go the same exactly the same order. So Andrew, you're you're excused. Uh, Noah or, or Alice, you want to jump in on? Yeah, yeah, I can go. Great. Um, uh, how did I start? I uh, was. I mean, I guess I guess the easiest answer is that I was an actor for a long time. Um, I always say that I was. I was joked that I was like not great, but I wasn't bad, <laughs> and so that feels like a useful distinction. Um, but when I. Uh, uh, enrolled in my undergrad, I knew that it was theater that I was not going to be studying or doing. Uh, so I enrolled in a six year program, uh, this very, very small, like intimate cohort of people to study special education, I never remember it, special education, communication disorder, and deaf adolescent language acquisition. And long story short, I was going to become an interpreter. Mm. Um, and this is worth knowing because it was six long years, it was very intense. And my access to theater just purely schedule wise, it was not really happening. And so I found at that time that the way I could access the form was through writing, writing it, uh, because I feel like all actors are uh, are just narcissistic enough to think that I can do it, I'm gonna write it. <laughs> and so like I tried, and so I tried, and I enjoyed doing it. And regardless of quality, it, um, it unlocked something for me. And I knew uh, that I wanted to continue doing it. And especially knew that when I realized that I was not a very good interpreter either. <laughs> so uh, there was a very good friend of mine. Uh, her name is Ellen Struve. She's a fantastic playwright based in Omaha, Nebraska, who's honestly like single-handedly sparked like a, a wave of playwrights coming out of Omaha. And she was the one who told me that I should do it. I should try doing it. She told me to apply to grad school. And I said, baby, I just finished six years of school. You think I'm gonna do more? But I did. So, um, and I, I had applied to a, hand, a number of schools, um, but one I had not anticipated applying to was the, the Yale School of Drama. Uh, I think simply just because of like name alone, um, it feels, felt inaccessible to me. And she was the one who told me that, um, that I, I needed to at least try. And so I did, and it was the first school I was accepted to um, based off her recommendation letter. Um, and it, so she, she is the one who I very much believe put me in a position, any kind of, any, any position I hold now is because of her. So, I, I, so I, I, I'm really thankful for her. And then I guess like uh, in time, a person that I, I felt a great kinship to while at school was my professor. Uh, Sarah Rule, and I feel thankful for her because she was the one who understood my work <laughs> when uh, very little others did at school. <laughs> and it was this one, this particular, actually, that's so funny, the um, play that I think first was first introduced to the, uh, to the folks of La Jolla was a play about Lewis and Clark, and I love it. I think it's great. Uh, no one else does. <laughs> the school hated it, <laughs> top to bottom. No one liked it. And I was like, wow, I guess I'll just go home. <laughs> so, uh, but, sh but Sarah was the champion. She um, really championed that play. And this one, this DNA work, I, I wrote this play, I think, I don't know, Gabe would know better. I don't remember what year. I was still in school. And I'd been, I'd maybe kind of been planning to use it for a thesis production. Um, and again, no one at that school liked it. <laughs> I don't know if they didn't like it. They, um, I don't think they fully knew exactly what I was trying to do with it because it was a mess. You know, it was, and I'm still figuring it out. Um, and everyone just kind of like politely like pushed me into a corner and said, good luck, figure it out. Um, and it was Sarah who in like our first meeting, because she was our one of our thesis advisors, um, she'd read it and was like, honestly, Noah, no notes. And I was like, that's not true, but thank you. <laughs> and so, um, but she was like, she was like, this is a play whose um, notes seem 
could seem useful, but in many ways unuseful. I was like, the try that you're the, the try that you're reaching for is the heart of this play. And she was like, it is a play that can hold mess. And and she was like, and so in that way, like I can offer notes. And she was like, I have thoughts, but really I don't have notes for you. And and uh frankly, she I had granted I had to turn in the commission for La Jolla, but like in many ways, I was gonna be like, I was gonna, I was fearfully gonna write this one off. I was just like, uh, well, I tried it, but it didn't work. Um, and it was Sarah who who encouraged me to to keep on with it. So, yeah, I'd say it was those two ladies who have really um, helped shape a lot of 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 what and who I've become. Thank you to can, those ladies. Can I tell you that the the Lewis and Clark play, which is the first I think thing that I read of yours, um, we uh, six or eight of us at the at the playhouse read it, um, and um, it was probably the most discussed play I've ever seen that ever that a bunch of people read like for about a month no matter where you were like you like what are you guys talking about oh it's Noah's play like they're the, just like everybody <laughs> couldn't stop talking and working and trying to figure out okay what's that scene like and I you know has that connect to the to the way the play ends and just like the there was something about that play that like got inside of your like wanting to figure it out and wanting to keep talking about it that I, I think is all so funny that you say that. So it was my second year production at school, um, and the and it's our shows run in rep or whatever. And so like they very much become like event. So like after every all of their everyone's plays, like everyone congregates in the lobby or like stick around and talk or whatever. Every single one of mine deserted. People <laughs> right on out. The, everyone was like, "Hi, yes, <laughs> congratulations," and they were just like leaving. So thank you for saying that. I I feel so self conscious about that play. Um, but you know what? People at La Jolla were talking about it. Absolutely. <laughs> I'm gonna send this a lot. I'm gonna send... uh, there it is. That's yeah, it. Yeah. I that love that. From, from the from the um, school production. <laughs> anyway, love yeah. That. Thank you. You know, as Mayakovsky always said, it's like it's only successful if it's equally liked and hated. So you. Oh have my God, it. Alice! You're working on all of my stuff from now on. <laughs> This is what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I, had a, I had a class from Peter Sellers when I was in high school. And uh, the thing that he said the very first day of class was, unless 30% of the people walk out, you haven't tried anything interesting, <laughs> which I don't actually agree with, but I like it's a provocative thought. As an artistic director, well said. <laughs> <laughs> so my 30% should stay <laughs> by subscription, but... <laughs> <laughs> um, I'd like to go ahead. next if I, oh, it's okay. I would love to actually read Lisa's statement about what sparked the sumo play because it's really fascinating. And she is an actor, very talented actor, and a great director of devised work and new work. So just wanted to add that besides her being a playwright. She says, I was originally drawn to sumo wrestling because it's a mixture of that which is competitive and that which is ritualistic. I feel a sense of devotion in my art making. And so I really resonated with the intense amount of ed dedication that is demanded of the wrestlers in this sport. Sports narratives are, to me, often iterations of the more masculine hero journeys in the Joseph Campbell sense. Someone conquers something and becomes triumphant. But in devotional practices, one needs to let themselves and their desires be subsumed by something more powerful. In this case, that thing is the spirit of sumo. And to me, that journey of surrender of being subsumed is tied to both East Asian forms of storytelling and the Greek notion of the feminine heroine's journey, for example, Persephone being taken into the underworld. I am a queer cis, cis woman writing about a group of men. I wanted to write about them because often my plays don't revolve around cis men and I wanted to spend time being curious about their hearts and minds. The men in this play call sumo she. And their relationship with this practice is in some ways a relationship with their anima or feminine counterpart. They become men through their relationship with the feminine. I feel like I may personally have been doing something in the inverse by studying men and finding new forms of compassion for and connection with them. I've become more intimate with my own identity. So I just love that her compassion and just, I mean, that's a, a note to playwrights, just to go to the opposite place that you never go and go ahead in. She did mention that Jen Kays, the artistic director of Circle X, um, she met her 12 years ago and is both mentor and a great friend and has a knack for dramaturgy that leads with immense compassion. So I just wanted to get Lisa Sanayadring's words in there. Um, 
Yes, thanks. Thank you, Alice, that's fantastic. All right, Andrew, you wanna bet clean up? Uh, sure. Uh, are you sure, Alice, that you just don't want to do it for me? I'm just kidding. <laughs> 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 um, uh, yeah. Uh, well, one, we were not prepared for the, like, when did you start? So now I'm just going to tell an embarrassing story. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> um, uh, so when I was in, I also started out as an actor and, and I was uh, stupidly doing that <laughs> since I was like uh, like a kid <clears throat> but like um, in high school, narcissistically, so similar Noah, narcissistically, um, somebody else like wrote a play in high school and was gonna put it on and I like a one act. And I was like, well, if they can do it, I can do it. So I wrote this play called Life. <laughs> and, um, and it ended with the Beatles yesterday. <laughs> um, it's <was> very <laughs> profound. <laughs> um, but, um, my mom came and saw it and uh, afterwards she found me and the first thing she said to me was, wow, that didn't suck. So um, then I was like, which tells you everything you need to know about my mother. But like, <laughs> <laughs> but also I was like, oh, maybe, maybe, maybe this is something. Um, so uh, it, took me, it took me a while to realize though that that is what I wanted to do. And I guess like two people that were like influential, one was an undergrad professor of mine who uh, his name his I mean he's passed away now and his name was Dr. Lewis Catron and I have mixed uh, feelings about him for a variety of reasons but but one of the things that he assigned us to do was to to write a play and I had never like written out, outside of that play or outside of just some dabblings for my like self that's the correct use of the word dabbling right okay. <laughs> <laughs> but um, uh, so I wrote this one act play over Thanksgiving break and turned it in. And then like a couple of weeks later, he like held me after class and like asked me to come into his office. And I was like, oh God, what, what have I done? Um, and he's like, I read your play. And I was like, <laughs> and um, he said, um, you know, if you want to take this seriously, you could have a career at it. And nobody in my life uh, has ever said something like that to me. And so that like really uh, resonated as, as something to take seriously and to, to contemplate and, and ultimately choose to like see w what can my voice do out in the world uh, and what is my voice and how to express it um, and uh, what is the way that I can do that. Um, and then uh, as pursuing playwriting, like one of the things I did was um, uh, had been doing it professionally, but had been outside of New York City, even though that's where I did my grad work. And I went back to New York City for a chunk of time and decided that I would like intern as basically a 30 year old at like New Dramatists. And uh, uh, while I was there, I met JT Rogers, who was very kind and considerate like with his time. And he was like, send me a play, I'll read a play. And I was like, uh, again, I was like, ha -ha, okay, <laughs> you're JT Rogers. Um, and, uh, and then he like read it pretty fast. And then he was like, can I send it to this director named Lucy Tabergian? And um, I think she should read it. And like, she also read it really fast because like JT never sends her anything. And then like, I was having coffee with Lucy and uh, I mean, that's, that is how like Tranquil got to the Playhouse initially and how I got a, a met you all, I met Gabe. And um, I just think about the generosity that JT then and continues to this day, like even if months go by and we haven't, haven't chatted or uh, seen each other, I can uh, pick up the phone and call him to like talk about something that I'm grappling with, uh, whether it's like in the work or whether it's like professionally a question or anything like that. And um, that is just a reminder to me as well about uh, the power that words to others and others that are coming up and our responsibility to that um, when you get to a certain place uh, to as you're continuing to climb, but also like those behind and the gift that was given to you as well. Love that. <clears throat> um, so I had a like massive question that I was going to ask um, that, that was uh, about the 
after 16 months of lockdown and in the middle of a national reckoning about race, what kind of theater do you think is essential to make right now? Which I think is a really interesting question, but I also want to get to the audience's questions. So maybe I'm going to simplify that question and just say, is there a thing that like right now, like this week, you've been thinking, wow, I think I want to say this in my writing soon. Is there like a, a, a thought that's occurring to you recently that's that you're chewing on? I can start it off with Lisa's comment. So maybe give Great. folks some. She says, I've changed in ways that are tectonic and still emerging. I don't have all the language for the person and artist I am now as compared to before COVID. I'm both gentler and more hard. And I hope to be more compassionate and grateful for the wild gift mm -hmm. of being with creators and making art. I want to tell stories that set us free. Mm. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah. But I, I kind of I kind of echo the I'm not sure who I am pre-COVID, post-COVID. I, I feel like we have actually the gift of this liminality right now. Right. Hmm. And to go ahead and grab all the freedoms while we can. That's fantastic. Uh, uh, no, a friend, Andrew. Yeah. I don't, I don't know if I really, uh, I've, always, I've struggled with that question the last however many months. Um, I don't know how, I don't know how I, how it will reflect in my work specifically, uh, but I do know something that I'm interested in and was actually just having a conversation with um, a very good friend of mine who's an artistic director, uh, Stephanie Barr at Baltimore Center Stage. And what I, a, a thought occurred to me uh, because she has given me a gift of multiple productions. Mm. Um, I am keenly interested in what it means to find and build a community who knows and uh, maybe not likes, but engages with, with my work. Um, I think what COVID has done for me, but it's, it feels like for so many of my uh, friends and collaborators is it really, really highlighted who and where we come from, whether it means that we actually explicitly like went back to our homes or we have like hunkered down, or we have refound our communities. Um, but you know, life as a playwright is hard. I mean, there is a scarcity of productions, and I am curious about, and I am pondering what it means to like. And uh, okay, I guess I should say this is not me like saying like give playwrights multiple productions at your theaters every single year. But I mean, mm -hmm. it, it it can be hard to like plant a seed when like you are constantly just finding next production somewhere, somewhere, somewhere. Uh, and I'm and I'm keenly just thinking about. It. I have no good answers about how we as playwrights can find the communities who are interested in our work and how we can foster that if we may not live in those communities specifically. So I'm thinking about that. Great. I mean, in some ways, Noah, I would echo just just in the not not only not only yes about communities, but it, it's a reminder of how. Um, uh, challenging it is to get a production, and that we spend years of our life working on um, on a play, and uh, and it's a reminder of like the especially this past year of like what is my mission as an artist, and what is the the reason that I do the work that I do, and the stories that I want to tell, and the gaze that I bring to it uh, that I want uh, to put out into the world, and and whether the play has a has a life on a stage somewhere uh, or whether it, it takes years for that, that that is like sustainable, sustainable and uh, a, a recommitment to um, the reasons that I like that I do this and the communities that I want to lift up and give space and breath to. Great. Yeah, I mean, similarly, and this may be like the wrong way to phrase it, but I, um, I've been thinking le less about theaters with an ER <laughs> um, and, and the idea of like, of, of productions. And um, I feel like what COVID has done is like made us slow down, like for better or for worse, but for me, it's been for, for the better of actually, of not thinking of like, the next play as something that needs to be on the fast track to like, how can I get this to production as quickly as possible? But more about like, how can I actually like, think about like, what do I want to do? And how do I want to do it? Um, and make sure that, you know, the product that I am putting out is something that like, hits all of those things before I start worrying about where is it going to go next? 
And I think it, it does stem from what you said, you no, know, like scarcity mindset and um, this idea that like the, you know, the younger you are, the the hotter you're, you'll be, or like your opportunity, your window of opportunity is so limited. And it's like, you know, trying to think back to, to that spark that, you know, made us want to sit down and write something like for the first time um, and to latching onto that um, and, you know, then thinking about like the, the career and the strategy piece of it. I just want to live in that first part a little bit more because I think that like the product that comes out is more authentic and more impactful. Um, Fran, that's like making me just think about like one one of the things. I mean, I'm always thinking about, but especially this past year is like how how do we define success for ourselves, and how do I define success for myself? Because, and I say that because like I don't know, like when I started out in this life, it was about like opportunities and productions, and then that was like an emotionally miserable experience for me. And and it also was like, wait a minute, like I'm not lifting up my peers the way I want to lift, like I'm weirdly feeling in competition with them. And so it's like a reminder, I feel like too, about like um, what is, how actually is success for the in the work that you're doing and why you're doing it is like something I think about, like for, for me, and this will sound altruistic, um, it, it is at a place of trying to put like good out into the world. I mean, like whatever, what, however, in as many ways as, as possible through the work, even if the work is challenging. Um, yeah, but it's, I, anyway, that's just what that was making me, what you were saying uh, and what this conversation was making me think about. That is all spectacular, thank you. Um, Gabe, do you want to, um, uh, Toss us some questions from um, other folks. I do. We're actually a little light on questions, but there have been a lot of really wonderful comments thrown in there. Sheree Engel, who uh, is an alumna of our uh, Veterans Playwriting Workshop, uh, Fran calls you out. Loves the love those pushes, Fran. Love the angels that push us to push ourselves. Uh, Elise Smith Cooper, uh, uh, creator of one of our digital Wow pieces, not too long ago, says, "Let it be shit first time out." Although she. Um, put used an asterisk, uh, <laughs> but let it be shit the first time out. Very encouraging for us perfectionists. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and malevolence DTE um, shared. I personally feel like more people are willing to see me, see us, and not be so consumed with how me being me may stop them from being themselves. Mm -hmm. So a lot of uh, a lot of love and respect coming in. Thank you all for watching and and for sharing those things. I have uh, just one. I have a quick question for you. This is the first year, uh, as Debbie mentioned in the preamble, this is the first time that we're able to offer projects multiple readings uh, a couple of days apart. And I'm wondering how uh, it was something that I mentioned to each of you in our initial phone calls uh, that had a lot of um, happiness behind it. What what does what do you learn from an audience? What, beyond the value of being around a table with actors and a director, can you talk a little bit about that, that final collaborator in the process, the audience, and, and why you're excited to have two presentations? Uh, uh, yeah, um, I feel like the benefit of two readings is that when it is often just one, you get to you get to use your audience as a metronome, and you get to understand how how and what it is they're reacting to. But the moments in which like that metronome like may speed up too much for your liking or get too slow, and those are the moments in which like okay, great, I need to I need to work on these moments. It can be hard to then go in and fine tune, and then find out if those if those tweaks work. And so having that you know, first audience, it, it tells you a lot. It gives you then, then an opportunity to go tweak and then actually test it again with a second audience. It's just simply um, more opportunity to, to really fine tune what it is and the spots, what it is I think I'm trying, I'm trying to fix and, and accomplish. Anybody else want to throw a thought about the two reading versus one? Well, I mean, no, go ahead, Fran, and then yeah, go. No, I have a very sim like simple answer. It's like the more the merrier. <laughs> yes. Yes. You know, yeah. like the more the more responses. Like I, I've been thinking about about audience a lot actually, and you know, um, I think it's very important to like define um, for each piece or for your for yourself as an artist, like who your audience is or you know who you want to have in the room. But I think that 
in general, like everyone should be your audience. Everyone should be <laughs> experiencing some theater. Um, and, and like to get those different perspectives, no matter who it is, like even if it's the person who's standing there giving you like a thousand notes where you're like, I don't actually like want to be in this position right now, please get away from me. Um, it's still really important and really valuable because it is a person who has come to experience the thing that the piece of art that you've created and art is for all. Um, so yeah, more the merrier. <laughs> Alice, Andrew, thoughts at all? I always feel like an audience has its own personality. And uh, so, and to have it so close together. I mean, I had a, a process like that at the Playwright Center, so useful because it's it's kind of like, um, you know, you get to write three dimensionally. It's not like you have one reading and then you go back and revise on a two dimensional plane. It's almost like between the two readings, there's this th third dimensionality of rewriting that is very rare that is kind of the gift of what DNA is providing, that it's so alive and you can you can just so, you know, because you never get readings so close together. You get to really feel, you know, oh, was that the audience that, that kind of reacted to that moment or is it the same reaction to that moment? You just learn so much more. It's almost like, um, you know, looking at a sculpture and you get to look at it from one side and then you get to look from the other side. You just get more dimensionality and the understanding of your play. I really agree with that. I feel like there's also a thing where by the time a play is really mature and found itself and and sort of finishing its writing process, it, it's it's the audience's response, it like starts to line up more night to night, right? And some of that's also because the play has a, a marketing communication out in the world and people sort of a little bit more know what they're going to see. And I feel like the early days of a play, like you can have such different audience responses based on the play still finding itself. The actors are fresh with it. The audience doesn't know what they're going to see. So they can take it in these wildly different ways. And there's a lot to be said for early in a play's life, having a couple of different audiences because they, they're not all going to be the same and you might learn different things from them. And it's also the thrill of adjusting performance. It's not maybe in the rewriting of the play, it's in the adjusting of how the performance is working, which is so valuable. Absolutely. I do want to clock that uh, Andrew was so appalled by the question that he, he just decided <laughs> to leave the call. And also answer Jay Lenak's question in the chat. Do you typically have a Q&A immediately after a reading with the audience to explore some different perspectives? And indeed we do. Uh, after every single reading and performance, uh, there is the opportunity to um, so, uh, to answer some, uh, we, we have a conversation, answer some questions. So please do stick around. Also, please, if, you, if your interest is peaked, as I hope it, it must be after this conversation, go to our website, uh, find the DNA series link and book your, your tickets to all of these readings. Don't Thank worry, you. Andrew, I answered for you. Oh my God, thank <laughs> God. I Very just got so emotional that I had to like <laughs> depart for a second. Um, yeah, the internet apparently didn't like me for a moment. But I hope you all Thanks. missed me. I'm we sorry. did, <laughs> yeah. and we're glad to have you back to say for to, for me to have a chance to say thank you to our guests so much. And we're we're, we're very um, we're shivering with anticipation about your your shows. And um, and thank you to our audience for joining us um, this morning for Coffee with a Playhouse. Gabe, last thoughts before we pass off to Debbie. No, just in case you missed any portion of today's chat or want to check out any of the previous Coffee with the Playhouse episodes, jump to our YouTube page and be sure to subscribe. Fantastic. Um, thank you all. And I think Debbie's about to come back. Here she comes. I am. And welcome back to Andrew. <laughs> we missed you while you were gone. <laughs> so thank you to our wonderful guests, to, um, to Francesca, to Noah, Andrew, and Alice, and, um, and always to, to Gabe and Chris for being as good at this as, as you guys are. Um, so just as Gabe mentioned, you can catch DNA at the Playhouse on July 22nd through 25th. Um, and again, from July 29th through August 1st. And also don't forget our pop-up um, WOW event at Liberty Station, um, August 14th and 15th, and Hasa Minaj at the end of this month as well. A lot going on. And then in the fall, we begin our subscription series um, with three world premieres, um, The Garden, To the Yellow House, and Banging It. So a lot going on at La Jolla Playhouse. We can't wait to see you. Um, and I just want to thank you again for joining us today and for your continued support of the Playhouse. 
though we are returning to in-person performances and being back together in person, we're going to continue doing um, these popular stream coffee with playhouses. There's a whole audience and we're just excited to stay with you and do them. So stay tuned for upcoming segments. Um, and so we'd like to leave you today with a video that we shared with you many months ago when we really didn't know when we would be returning to live events. Um, and now that that moment is pretty much upon us, we wanted to share it again. It seemed very appropriate. So thank you and goodbye and we will see you soon and enjoy the video. What can theater be? It can be a place to gather with friends. It can be a place to find joy. It can be a place to dream. It can be a place to celebrate. But a theater is more than a place. Theater creates empathy. It forges community. It starts conversations. Theater opens the world, giving us a glimpse into other people's lives. It disrupts the status quo and challenges our beliefs. Theater reflects our world and on its best days has the power to change it. We need theater and everything it can be now more than ever. Someday, hopefully soon, we will gather again. On that day when the lights are cued and the actors again take to the stage, know that there's a seat for you.